Okay, our next panelist uh, for this afternoon's session is Katie Zedlick uh, in the Department of Anthropology at Western Carolina University. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, by this point in the day, my head is spinning, and I'm not even sure I know right from left anymore. This has been incredible. As the only anthropologist in the room, I'm going to change the direction a little bit. Uh, when I was first asked to come, I was amazed and surprised and thrilled. And I think part of it is because I run a human decomposition facility at Western Carolina University, one of only eight in the country. So we've been talking all day about death. I'm about to show you some. Um, I tried to keep the gross stuff out. I do want to note human remains, mostly skeletal, a couple pictures of decomp. Everything has been done with permission of the individuals in the photos. This is a really big deal. In anthropology, as we are often accused of taking advantage of indigenous peoples and people that don't have the ability to tell us to not put their ancestors up, but uh, these images are with uh, permission. So I just want to talk a little bit about the anthropology of death in general. Again, as the only anthropologist, anthropologists really attempt to view humans from a really holistic perspective. We're not just interested in death from the biological perspective, what words in the culture, the language, talk about death? How deeply embedded in culture is death? Is there archaeological evidence of it? Um, and so perceptions of death and the mortuary practices associated are absolutely numerous. We could spend days and days and days talking about them. One of the big statements you'll hear and see and read in anthropology is the dead do not bury themselves. And uh, perceptions about death and what happens after you die are all about the cultures you live in, the politics. We can talk about everything from religion when the Pope dies. Did anybody ask him what he wanted? Probably not. When Lincoln died, did he want to travel the country unembalmed, looking pretty gross by the end? Did his wife or family? Probably not. Politics is a big deal. Socioeconomic. Think about how we treat our poor and our prisoners, and you would be um, pretty surprised to see the way we as what we consider ourselves westernized, civilized Americans are doing to our dead. If anyone's never heard of Heart Island in New York, check it out. It is a heartbreaking cemetery of the poor, the orphaned, the indigent, everything, um, and unknown. You will see people throwing the coffins of infants, um, tossing them. Prisoners from Rikers Island tossing coffins of infants into a hole, and every 10 feet is a marker for 3,000 deaths of children. We don't even know who they are. So last night, the uh, topic of the Tanatarajans of Sulawesi, Indonesia, came up. These, this is the cultural group in Indonesia that curate their dead. So again, we have very westernized perspectives of death, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more at the end of the discussion of what death is. And the Tanatarajans are not the only ones who curate their dead. As somebody mentioned last night, uh, when anybody in the family dies, the body is essentially mummified. They used to use natural, um, I guess, herbs and plants. Now they use formaldehyde and water. And they essentially are mummifying these individuals. And they live in the house. They are fed. They are changed. They attend dinners. Um, even after the funeral, which is sort of the ultimate point that the Tarajans are reaching in the uh, veneration of the ancestor and their memory, even at that point, their tombs are visited and they are reclothed. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Uh, but to move away from that little bit of the Tanatarajans, this is one of their trees. So in Tanatarajan society, if you are a child that has not yet teethed, you have not reached personhood. And the idea of personhood, again, is a whole topic for another conference. Um, you are put in the hollowed out part of this tree, and the thought is that the wind will take your soul and your body will nourish the tree and you will have another chance to come back. So we have to talk about ideas of animistic beliefs and reincarnation with death. The worry of Peru are cannibal, um, mortuary cannibals, so they consume their dead because they think the westernized idea of putting a dead body in the ground um, is... Uh, an awful thing to do. It's cold and it's dark and they're alone. So they bring the essence of the individual into themselves and they are reincarnated as the white peccaries, which are a really important part of their belief system. And I've already mentioned the poverty stricken in America. So as anthropologists talk about death, our minds go to everything you're talking about and all of these other things that are culturally based, temporally based. I am, by definition, I identify as an anthropologist. 
I've kind of got my foot in two fields. I spend my summers excavating a medieval cemetery in Transylvania, Romania, which is not the topic of the conversation today, but I am happy to talk about it later. Um, and as a biological anthropologist. So biological anthropologists aren't so much interested in death, but what happens after death or what caused the death. And we will study mortuary treatments. We look at skeletons and bodies for indicators of health. We're interested in mortality um, in different populations, in different cemeteries, who's dying when, is there any way to tell how. We're interested in everything that happens to a body after it dies. So that's taphonomy. And you'll see some pictures after you die and I place you on the ground and start watching you decompose what plants, animals, et cetera, are affecting your remains. So for us, death is not actually the end. And um, I've been thinking about this conference a lot, and I spent the last week in Austin with my other biological anthropologist colleagues at the National Conference, and I asked them, you know, what do you think of death? And we just don't think of death. Maybe we think of our own deaths, and we think about, <laughs> the top comes up, what do you want to do with your body? But the idea of dying and how it affects people has really not come up because death is not the end for us. The science continues to talk to us. So um, this is actually a tattoo my husband has, so he designed it and I stole it. The living serve the dead, serve the living, serve the dead, and that's essentially what we're doing. Um, human remains continue to speak. There's a ton of TV shows out there about uh, the dead tell tales and what are they telling us, but this is the reality of it. How did that person live? They're not just bodies, they're not just skeletons. When you die, and anybody dies rather, when I'm observing this, when I'm looking at a skeleton that's 500 years old or 3,000 years old or six months, um, every, not everything you did, but things you did in your life have been uh, placed on that skeleton. How did they die? Um, you'll see a picture of a, a train suicide later. Uh, it's, we look at, um, death, uh, pathogens, uh, sort of all the topics we've talked about. We speak as if the person is still living, and in fact, it's really important. When I get students, so in addition to directing the facility, I'm also an assistant professor, and when I get students saying, well, I'm only in it for the bones, or, um, you know, discussions of this person as being dead, it, that's not the case. These are humans, they were humans, they continue to be humans. And so we speak of them and the lives that they lived almost as if it never really ended. So decomposition facilities are sort of a sexy and gruesome topic depending on your perspective. Sadly, this is the only picture of the facility I have from Western and it looks pretty dismal despite the amount of greenery that's typically out there. Um, there are eight of them. They are uh, casually called body farms. I still refer to it as a body farm occasionally. It's not the professional way to say it, but that way people know what I'm talking about. The first one went up in 1987, University of Knoxville, Tennessee by Bill Bass. Uh, it was really important at the time to be able to study decomposition and what happens to bodies after they die so that when an individual is found in the woods, we can look at it and look at potentially how long they've been dead um, and what modifiers such as weather, animals, etc., have affected that individual. Western Carolina University is where I am at. We were the second facility in the country in 2006, so it took a while before it caught on. And then several followed, two in Texas, Illinois, Colorado, uh, Florida, and the newest one, Northern Michigan University in Marquette. I don't know if they're officially accepting people, but they did hire a director last year, so they will be the most northern facility. Eight in the United States, there's one in Australia, and I have received a number of emails from people looking to start them in other parts of Europe. Uh, in the United States, we've got different laws regarding um, if you can work with tissue and how and who must be qualified and that kind of thing. So we've got a little bit more freedom to work with human remains. So what's the purpose of these facilities besides documentaries on forensic files and et cetera? Uh, we're collecting quantifiable data about human body decomposition. So prior to these facilities, um, pigs were used as proxies for humans to look at how they decompose. You've seen it on TV shows. How does a bullet travel through a body? That kind of stuff. But pigs are not people, and people do decompose differently. And prior to that, it was conjecture. So if you're going to court and you are saying this person's been dead for four days based on something you observe, but you can't cite an article to support it, it's really easy to rip that apart. 
in court. And so it's really important that our forensic anthropologists and other medical legal professionals testifying have real data to work with. We do it by observing a number of modifiers. So there are a lot of facilities, um, again to jump back, that sort of dot the country. Knoxville, granted Knoxville's relatively close to us, but we exist in a, believe it or not, pretty different um, physiographic zone. You would imagine that Texas and Michigan are pretty different. We're dealing with altitude, precipitation, general temperatures, and of course you're going to have different flora and fauna. So, and just general observations, what the vultures are doing in Texas are not what the vultures are doing where we are at. We are the only rural forested body facility in the country. We're also the only one who caters strictly to undergraduates because we don't have a grad program, so our undergraduates are getting some pretty impressive um, experience. And so what we can do as facilities is compare our research, look at different places in the country, compile the data, and create a nice body of knowledge for people to work with. The one in Knoxville, I should know, used to be rural, but is now in the parking lot of the medical park, um, which is ironic if you think about it. This picture I got off Pinterest, it's a cookie, which is disgusting. Um, <laughs> So basically what's going on when you die is your body is eating itself from the inside while everything else is eating you from the outside. There's five stages of decomposition. You're going to cool off, you're going to go into rigor mortis, you're going to come out of rigor mortis, and then autolysis is basically just eating yourself. You're going to bloat, the gases are going to build up, your body's going to turn purple, it's going to rupture, everything's going to come out. The maggots who are there almost from the minute of death are going to, excuse me, they're going to migrate and they actually do, they move from one part of the facility to the next. Um, eventually insects leave, most of the soft tissue is gone and over time you skeletonize. Again, in all of these different facilities, these things will happen at different rates. It also depends on what is affecting you. So the vultures in Texas are taking those bodies down in a day or two sometimes. The vultures in Western Carolina, they just sort of nitpick. Um, one will come in and one will leave, but we're forested, so one's vigilantly watching from up top while the ones are eating down below and their turkey vultures are fighting with the black vultures and nobody is letting the crows in and it's really an interesting sort of bird social system going on right now. So once the body has gone through all these stages at our facility, we wait until the individual skeletonizes, we go in, we take pictures, we bring the body back to the lab and we work on methods. So where do the bodies come from? Despite the conspiracy theories you might read if you look up the facility at Western, we are not a disposal ground for the government when they don't like you anymore. Um, in fact, people want to be there. So again, thinking about how people approach their own deaths. I have people that call me Almost daily, um, I'm going to go back after being here for three days and have an enormous number of voicemails on my phone for people that just want to donate. They're also donated by the next of kin, usually as a result of the individual having spoken about it and never got around to doing the paperwork. We do know who everybody in our facility is. We don't have any Jane or John Doe's. We have paperwork, death certificates. It's all above board. It's all legit. That's another question I get a lot. Um, there's a number of reasons that people want to donate. So part of the job that's so interesting between running the lab, teaching um, classes, is talking to people on the phone and you never know what that phone call is going to entail. But almost everybody wants to tell you why they're donating themselves or their next of kin. Some people want to donate to science but they don't want to be picked apart in a medical school. They feel it's too public or too vulnerable or it's too normal, believe it or not, and so they want to donate somewhere else. Some people have been watching forensic files for a really long time and they want to solve cold cases. They want to contribute to um, identifications and to search and recovery. So part of what we do at Western is we train cadaver dogs. has become really popular so we're becoming an active part of the search and recovery community. And simply identification. So after the body skeletonizes they go back into the lab and we have one of the few known collections in the United States. So we can look at this and we know this individual was an adult, um, Caucasian or white male that was 75 at death. He was um, he had this surgery and this trauma, and we can look at these patterns so that someday, if somebody else has a similar bone modification, um, or we're trying to improve our ability to estimate age and sex and ancestry and trauma and pathology from skeletons, we can go back to our known collection and compare um, to this unknown individual. Some people want good out of tragedy. So this is an individual, he was 49 when he died, and 
Um, he stepped in front of a train because he couldn't handle it anymore. I spoke with his father um, quite a bit, in fact. And so, and this one actually really got me. Uh, suicide is sad, so excellent presentation. Man, bums me out. And his father expressed that he really needed, the family wanted something positive to come out of this suicide. Medical schools won't take an individual that has any uh, form of trauma because they're, being, they're teaching uh, donations, right? But this is really important for forensic anthropology. We can look at this individual, not only develop methods, like I talked about for age and sex estimation, but we can look at the trauma present on this individual, look at how the bones broke. So you can see, does this work? These are his femora, his thigh bones, and we can look at this type of fracture. Forensic anthropologists will talk, you, talk to you for days about fracture types and patterns and what caused them, and this is gonna be a good resource. This is his skin that's left. He's been out since about mid-October um, in the woods in North Carolina. I just took this a couple days before I came out here. Some people are interested in sort of the green environmental movement of it all. Um, I, you come to the facility, the students and I collect the paperwork and we pull you into the facility and we leave you on the ground and that's it. There's no chemicals, there's no anything that really happens. We watch with motion activated game cameras, we take photos, we take notes, but essentially um, we do not touch you. In fact, this individual, the bottom of his legs have been drugged down by the vultures and so we're sort of tracking, um, again, how the birds are um, handling this particular individual. And the uh, sort of last service we serve is cost. Doesn't cost anything to come to us. In fact, we're more than happy to take you with a uh, short list of reasons we would exclude. And so I'm finding that we serve a lower socioeconomic, um, unfortunately, status of people who cannot bury. And they see this as a means to do something positive and affordable. And so if you can get your person out to us, and in North Carolina, you can put them in the back of the truck and bring them right out to me, it's totally legal, um, then we are serving that as well. So, considering the, the uh, theme is evolution, I'm gonna go broadly with evolution, as in change over time, not change in uh, allele frequency in subsequent generations, and just say how this has affected us. So this on the top is a picture of the facility. I did blank out some of the faces. The bags that you see are onion bags because we are on an 18 degree slope and the hands and feet tend to migrate downhill at skeletonization. Um, that's the grossest one, so you're okay. But you know, this is death. This is biology. This is decomposition. This is what happens. And you know, what's so interesting to me is that people want to do this, and this isn't a secret. You can watch any number of YouTube videos and um, reports that have been professionally published, that have been sort of pop culture. Um, but people know the reality of donating to a facility. Uh, we've managed to go from conjecture to using pigs as proxies to actually looking at people and all eight of these facilities look at people. Um, there are a handful of facilities that still look at pigs, rabbits, and believe it or not, vultures were also being used, but because the science with people is better, that's where they're going. We've got quantifiable data. We can increase population-specific assessment based on the known ancestry of individuals. And so when you are looking at forensic anthropology and trying to establish age and sex and stuff, you're looking at um, different effects on how the body ages, or just simply robusticity and gracility. And if you look at populations from around the world or even the United States, you're gonna see different levels of that. There's gonna be location-specific stuff instead of just Knoxville being the only body farm, we can now look across the country for how bodies decompose in different climates. Uh, and we also are increasing our knowledge about the various types of trauma. We typically train undergraduate students, medical legal professionals, we're making ourselves open to law enforcement and really anybody else within the medical legal or end of life profession that wants to learn about this. The facility is not open for public tours. You are not allowed out there unless you have a good reason and the permission of myself and my colleagues. It is not a human zoo and we're very, very protective of that. Um, and then, like I said, we train cadaver dogs. One of the most interesting things that I've seen really happen is in 1982, when William Bass first started thinking about putting in the facility, it was a morbid science. So this is a nice black and white picture of the Knoxville facility. No trespassing, do not come in here. And people didn't want it in their backyards. They don't want it in their communities. It's death, it's gross. Um, this is... Uh, 
an abomination, the, the various perspectives. And in a relatively short time, people have come to accept facilities. Like I said, we're seen as a part of Green Burial, but we are um, now unknowingly been accepted as part of the death positive movement. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. It's sort of spearheaded by Caitlin Doty, who's got a couple books out on it. She is a, um, she's a mortician, and what she's trying to do is show that westernized culture, we have this perspective of death that it's gross and it smells bad and it's toxic and as soon as it happens we don't want anything to do about it. We want to talk about why people die and how they perceive death and all of this but we certainly don't want to touch them when they're bloated and when their skin is falling off. But in the reality of our history is across the world this is exactly what families do. You had home funerals, you washed the body, you clothed it and so what Doty and the death positive movement are trying to do is show that death doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be scary. It's a trans transition in life, and depending on your belief system, it could be a really long-held transition, like the Tana Tarajans. In fact, the Tana Tarajan houses are in the shape of the coffins that they're ultimately buried in. So from the minute they're born, they exist not in a macabre culture of death, but in a celebration of what's to come next. It's a really positive look. I give you this an Esquire, right? Strange publication. But this individual, um, the Oberlins, Kate and Deloy. Kate is out at the facility, and Deloy was a big proponent of this death positive movement, and so they had a home funeral. It's beautifully documented in this article. Um, they made the coffin. Kate was carried out to our facility, and she remains um, right now. And when she has skeletonized, she will go back to her family. So basically, um, we try to view death from a really holistic perspective. I would say most of us don't think of death in the way a lot of people do, and in fact, it, it can be quite beautiful. The science of it is not as dark and macabre, and it has had such an important impact on serving a range of social um, groups and populations and helping the medical legal system. Again, they're physically dead, but they will tell us stories excavating in Transylvania. These individuals are five to 800 years old, and we're always learning something new from them. Um, perceptions have changed, but they're changing in the right direction. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Questions? So the exclusion criteria, and they're specific to everybody, um, almost anybody, including med schools, will say any of the main bloodborne pathogens. So any of the HEPs, MRSA, HIV, um, we cannot take. It is a health risk. Um, for us, we also exclude individuals with a weight at death of over 250 pounds, and that's only because we have to carry you up a hill into the facility, and so um, it has been decided that that is sort of the threshold limit for what we can handle safely. We are modifying entrance into the facility to hopefully ex include more people because it's not just weight, right? Basically anybody over six feet almost can't be included. So it is affecting our overall skeletal collection. Um, but those are the two primary at this point. How big is the facility? How many bodies are out there? So we have a relatively small facility. Um, we have two facilities. The surface facility has, they both have chain link fence around them, but the surface facility also has a 10-foot privacy fence with barbed wire and razor wire around it to prevent people who want to sneak into the, the body farm. Um, they're each about 1,000 square feet, so they're not huge. Right now, I've got, we have, eight individuals that are in various states of decomposition, and that is only this picture, and that's not even, I mean, that might be 20% of the facility. On the surface, we've probably got an additional 20 people buried in the other facility. So you're not replacing cemeteries? Not yet, and in fact, we probably won't. So it's actually a misconception of what we do, is we do do green burial, but part of the requirement is that your body stays with us, so we can study your skeleton, and people that are interested sometimes want the body back. They're also interested in um, composting human remains, which we did a project for um, Katrina Spade, who's got a website called Recompost, where they're looking at the science to completely compost an individual, but part of what we need are the skeletons so that we can work on skeletal methodologies. So, sort of that, yeah. I, I, 
Do you bury some of the bodies to see what happens if they're underground, or do you leave some clothes to see what happens with mm -hmm. the clothes on? Yeah, the facilities do a lot of interesting stuff. In the past, we've done uh, left clothing on. Um, right now, most of the clothing is coming off because we don't have a specific resource or research project looking at it. And we do bury to look at how long it takes for decomposition, depending on depth, age, and number of factors. Some of the larger facilities, like San Marcos, has multiple uh, acres. They can do more interesting stuff, and if you really want to get into some of the crazy stuff. Knoxville has done things like burning people in cars. Um, they will build small structures and, and burn them that way. They most recently, I believe, did one where they hung three people from a tree to see how long it would take for the skeletons to decompose and drop. And so we have replicated a couple of things and sometimes um, law enforcement will get an unusual case and say, we have no idea how this happened. Can you replicate it? And if it's ethical and within our means, we will often do it. Let's say reach the skeletal stage, you bring them back and mm -hmm. keep them beyond that. But, um, the question how much the skeleton is always there? It functions as if it takes <laughs> the, the, there was a, I remember in Mumbai being close to a, there's a hill there where they, they are bodies to be picked up by the birds. The streets around are, are full of finger bones and things like that, which the birds have dropped. They're kind of removing quite a lot as they go along. So how much how much is left? <laughs> We keep a pretty good eye on it, and so we typically get most of the skeleton, but you're right, the hand and foot bones um, will sometimes just be carried away and occasionally roll downhill, so we have to reassociate them, hence now the bags on the hands and feet, because again, part of the goal is to not only study decomposition, but to have the full skeletons. You'd be surprised forensic anthropologists are writing papers on how to identify the sex of an individual based on the first metatarsal, um, because sometimes that's all you find. And so having complete skeletons is really important, and we go to some lengths to make sure that happens. One, one further question. Uh, do, do you have got any babies uh, yet? And have you yet got to the point at which people want to be to decompose alongside their kin? Yes. Um, well, one a baby, really, um, in the collection. It was a mother that died during childbirth. And I don't know the history of this donation because I wasn't, well, I was at Western, but I wasn't running the facility. Um, and the babies we don't put out. We bring them into the lab and we macerate them in the lab because they're mostly cartilaginous and they have tiny, tiny bones. And so to preserve the babies, um, I believe there are, I want to I wanna say San Marcos is doing work with babies, but I'm not sure. And again, it's sort of a perspective thing. Do you want your baby buried there? Um, oh, I had another point. I can't Sorry, you, did you, you had another part, part of your question that I'm not. Just whether you've got family groups. Oh, right, right. Um, I do have a couple of uh, married couples where one has passed and the other is still coming out. And one of the um, bodies I put out this fall was the wife of a gentleman who was already at the facility and their son has already also pre-donated his remains. And they had wanted to do this 30 years ago when the first one went up in Tennessee. Um, and most of the people out there are from the North Carolina or Western North Carolina area and they happened to also be from North Carolina. So uh, yeah, they are not the only, only ones. Okay, thank you.